G'day and welcome back to RC Model Reviews. I've got some receivers on the bench today and uh, some of them are pretty old actually. This is a fairly recent FreeSky receiver. The antenna's fallen off. It's just one of the little four channel ones. Um, this is something that goes back. This is PCM, which is pulse code modulation. It was a digital kind of transmission in the long wire days. See, it's got a long wire hanging off it. Here's another long wire receiver. This is a um, just a simple FM receiver, but it did have a little bit of smarts in there just to filter out bad signals so you didn't get glitches with these and this is the granddaddy of them all that is an OS Pixie super regenerative transistorized receiver from the 1960s so old now I'm going to take a look at each of these receivers we're going to look and compare how the technology has changed through the years this you would have found in the the 1960s this would have been late would be 80s I would say this was 90s to early noughties and this is contemporary this is today so let's start by taking a look at the oldest of them first so here it is the OS Pixie I've taken the top off and I'll take the board can I get the board out of the box I'm not too sure these were a bit dodgy at times yeah she's looking a bit um, I think it might have some foam holding it in in the bottom but I'll try and get it out without breaking it Oh man, I might have to pull this long wire through. It has a, uh, I don't want to wreck it because I do intend to use this. Believe it or not, I do intend to use this receiver in a project. Sorry about the blurriness. Here we go. Look, yes, I was right. It has some foam in it. Um, here we go. I'll peel that foam back. <laughs> this is crazy stuff. There is the circuit board, as you can see. It is, come on, focus camera. It is a single sided circuit board. That means there's only copper on the bottom, not on the top. And if you look there, you can see. It's got lots of discrete components. So I'm going to try and point out some of those components for you as we go through, just in case you're not up with the play electronically. Right, we've got a huge relay here. This is a relay because this thing didn't drive servos. It drove something called an escapement, which is something I might talk about in a future video. But it's a mechanical, electromechanical device, electromagnet with some contacts. Basically, that's what that is. These little vertical things here with the stripes and the wire, that's a resistor. And these are what we call through hole components. That is to say, they, the wires go through holes in the board and are soldered on the back here. Um, here's a transistor. Woohoo, look at that. And I think it's a germanium transistor, which is really, really old. Um, these were superseded by silicon transistors pretty early on on the piece. So this shows how old this is. Here's a capacitor, an electrolytic capacitor. That's a ceramic capacitor. Um, what have we got here? Another transistor. This is an RF transistor. Great big thing. Here's the tuning coil at the front. We've got some more resistors. And we've got a little transformer here. This basically allows us to get the signal out of our front end of our receiver, it turns it into audio. And let's just count the trans. There's actually got a lot of transistors, I'm surprised. It's got one, two, three, four transistors, this receiver, which is quite a bit for a super regenerative receiver. I actually remember building some back in the day and I only used two transistors. So yeah, these were a really good receiver. Excellent range, excellent range. Now, those of you who remember the long wire days are probably saying, where's the crystal? Where there's no crystal in this, how do, you how do you change frequencies? Well, see that little screw thing there? You twist, put a screwdriver in there and turn that. There's no crystal on this old SuperGen receiver. So they were basically manually tuned. You just turned it until you got the strongest signal, which is, um, yeah. Uh, but the problem is, of course, they were not very selective. When you flew a SuperGen receiver like this, only one person could fly at a time because they were so broadly tuned that if you had two transmitters, even if you had an opposite ends of the band, they would still interfere with each other. So I remember when I started flying RC, um, Super Agen was still a thing, but if you wanted to fly Super Agen, you had to grab all the frequency pegs for the entire band if you wanted to fly, so no one else would turn on. It was, yeah, happy day. So there you go. As you can see, the, the circuit board itself is brown. That's what we call a phenolic board, which means basically it's layers and layers of paper held together with resin. It's really old school. And as you can see, there's, uh, the component density is pretty low. You can see a lot of that board. Let's get these wires out of the way. You can see a lot of that board looking down from the top, see? So it's not really tightly packed. Uh, this is why Radio Gear was so big and it weighed so much. So this was the, the old school, the, I, I don't have any valve gear, I'm afraid, but this was the first of the, the transistorized stuff. And eh, for what it was, it worked really well. But let, let's, let's move forward a little bit to, I don't know, maybe the, the 1980s. And this is a JR PCM 40 megahertz receiver. Let's take the lid off it. And you can see now the, the circuit board's a different color. Um, green, how fancy is that? I'll take this out of its little plastic case if I can. There we go. And you'll notice now much more 
density of components so everything is much more tightly packed and unfortunately this is a dual layer of things so we can't actually see too much because this board on the top gets in the way but some things we'll notice in here um, some are familiar some are not we still have um, some vertical components now that's probably I'm not sure if that's a resistor or a coil, it's been hard to tell from where I'm looking at the camera. We've got little ceramic capacitors like we had before. These are ceramic capacitors as well. And again, they're through hole. The leads go through the circuit board and are soldered on the other side. Something new is this canned inductor. See, we've got some things here. They've got an adjustment here for tuning, changing the inductance. Another one there. Um, these things were basically to tune the receiver. And we had some that were the front end tuning, this one here, and then we had the inter intermediate frequency tuning there. So when the signal came in at 40 megs or 72 megs or whatever, it was converted down to a lower frequency where it could be amplified more efficiently and it could be filtered and select, you know, filtered out. So we had a, a bandpass filter. So with these, suddenly we could fly more than one because it's a super heterodyne receiver, not super regenerative. We could fly, initially, I think it was eight channels on the 27 megahertz band. And then as things went along, uh, the number of channels grew because they Put them closer and closer together because these extra tuning elements here enable us to get much better selectivity out of our receivers so suddenly we could run more receivers using slightly closer or closer frequencies at the same time and one thing you'll notice here there is a little socket there because this was a crystal controlled receiver and here is the matching crystal as you can see it comes a little plastic thing just plugs into there and that sets the frequency of the receiver so to change channels to change to a different frequency you just change the little crystal element no no tuning required as long as you stay within the band pretty straightforward and this was a pretty good receiver for its day because as well as these um, tuning cans here it had one of these this is a ceramic filter it's like a a tuning coil but it's much sharper and it also there's no moving well it's got a piece of quartz crystal in there so it's actually or a ceramic substrate so it actually vibrates at very high frequencies it's a it's a really good way to filter stuff these were a bit easily damaged in crashes though so sometimes if you had a really bad crash chances are you'd either break the crystal or you'd break the ceramic filter now this one has got another filter in here because it's a dual conversion i won't go into that but suffice to say this is a really good quality receiver for the day for the era and if we did get right inside we'd probably find that there were some integrated circuits as well but as i say unfortunately um i can't lift the top off that i don't want to ruin it but you can see now things are getting far more densely packed and the components are actually a bit smaller um, these are much smaller capacitors and resistors and things and um, we're, we're getting better performance because we've got all these extra coils in there different design different concept so yeah that was it um, that was the 1980s roll around the 1990s and things got even better we're still long wire see that long wire but look at the small size of that let's compare that with the well there's the case for the uh, for the uh, 1980s receiver and here's the 1990s things suddenly got a whole lot smaller how'd they get smaller well a greater use of integrated circuits and um, that meant we could fit more stuff into a smaller space now this still has the tuning elements the little coils it has a ceramic filter another ceramic filter and so it, it's not that much different in terms of actually how it works but instead of a whole lot of transistors there are actually integrated circuits and they're designed to do all the work so instead of individual transistors they've all been well the transistors have been merged into a integrated circuit which massively reduces the amount of space that is required but fundamentally it's not a lot different to the 1980s technology just a bit smaller and more densely packed so now it's goodbye 1990s hello 2010 and onwards basically maybe a bit later this is the kind of receivers we're working with today and you'll notice that they as far as the actual footprint goes they're not that much smaller but if you look at them from the side look how much look at the, how much lower profile they are where are all the ceramic filters where are all these coils if you look on here there's no you can't see any coils those orange things there they're not ceramic filters although they look a bit like them they're just capacitors and they're not, not like the old capacitors that had to go through holes in the board all the stuff mounts on top of the board it's what we call surface mount components it's that there that's the uh, I think that's the RF receiver chip that's probably got you know a huge number of component and transistors and active elements in there it's built everything into that tiny little blob of black and on the other side we've got the another chip here and this is uh, I, can't, I haven't actually had a look but one of these chips is the processor that decodes all the information and then scoots it out to the uh, to the channel connections and this thing here this little thing here that is actually a crystal remember there's the crystal from 19 uh, what is it um, 19 80 right <laughs> there's the crystal from the 21st century so everything's much smaller everything's super tiny now and it mounts on both sides of the board now on the older receivers we only had stuff on one side of the board here's that um here's that uh 
PCM one, you'll notice there's nothing on this side of the board, there's nothing on that side of the board, it's what we call a single side load. Now we can squeeze stuff onto both sides of the board and everything's smaller and we end up with a much, much lighter, much smaller receiver. And the beauty of it is, they're also a lot more reliable and crash proof. If you look at these things here, if we take a look at the, the old PCM receiver, if you have a big crash, so suddenly you're flying along and there's a sudden stop, bing, like that. All these components here try and lean over. They keep going. The board stops, they keep going. So it rips the wires out of the circuit board or it rips fine wires inside these coils. So these, if you had a really bad crash, quite often the receiver would be damaged. I mean, these things, you can just about hit them with a hammer and they don't mind. Today, things are just so much tougher. And of course, they're also cheaper. Because if you look at it, putting all these components through holes in the board, a bit of a laborious process. There were machines that did it, but back in those days, the pick and place machines, as they're called, were nowhere near as sophisticated or effective as the ones we have today. So building a receiver, the actual amount of time involved in actually populating those boards was significantly higher than today. And of course, because everything here is so small, the amount of raw materials involved are lower and they're made on a higher volume. So super, super, super cheap for all the components. Um, and speaking of components, let's do some side-by-side -side comparisons between the old school components and the new components. What we have here is an old school resistor, and it's actually a really small old school resistor compared to the size of my finger. This is super, super small. It's actually quite a bit smaller than the, than the resistors we found in this old uh, OS receiver, for example. Let's have a, see if I can, I'll put it back in its box, but here we go. If you compare the size of that resistor, oops, if I can pick it up, with the size of the resistors in there, you'll see that it's actually, it is noticeably smaller than those ones, and these are really small for the day. So these, what they call through hole components, uh, they can be made small, but I'm going to show you how, how ludicrous it all is. The equivalent in today's technology, this, this isn't actually a resistor, it's a capacitor, is there. Can you see it? Is it? <laughs> we can make components this small today. Compare the size with that. It's like unbelievably different. And so instead of having great big boxes of these resistors, um, you can get little drawers like this. And so for example, if we go in here, let's take a, um, what have I got on there? 220 ohms, where's that? 220 ohms, so I just open the little drawer, ding. And if you look in there, you can see a whole bunch of resistors. And these are actually bigger than the ones I showed you, but but tiny, tiny little things. So they are lighter, they are more resistant to impacts and damage, and they're cheaper, cheaper by a long shot. So um, the fact that things have changed this much explains why radio gear is now so much cheaper and more reliable. Um, and as I said, on, in the new receivers, where are all the tuning elements? Where are the coils? Where are the, um, you know, the, the things that set or enable us to filter stuff out? Well, there are some coils left on there, but because we're dealing with very, very high frequencies now, 2.4 gigahertz versus 27 megahertz, everything's so much smaller because as you go up in frequency, the coils become smaller and some receivers have a few elements and they are, the coils can look that big. That's how small they go. And they don't need to be adjustable because with digital circuitry, um, basically, you know, it's like software. Everything is uh, built so that it, it can be adjusted with software. So the frequency is set with software because we're doing frequency hopping with 2.4. So the software just changes the tuned frequency the receiver is listening to many times a second so that it hops across the band, listens to the transmitter, which is also hopping. So we don't want to have to retune our coils or change crystals to do that. So it's all done in software with things called uh, phase locked loops and voltage controlled oscillators. Yeah, that's a whole lot of garbage, but <laughs> basically suffice to say, it's magic. It's just magic, it really is, it's just magic. So there you go, that's, <laughs> that's how things have changed in a very relatively short space of time, I suppose. And it's only gonna get smaller, it's only gonna get lighter, it's only gonna get cheaper and more reliable. So spare a thought for those of us who in the 1960s had to use stuff like this and deal with the reliability issues and the performance issues and everything else and the cost, the huge cost that went with it. So, cause I mean, a PCM receiver like this could have cost you a hundred bucks. And this is back in the old days when a hundred bucks would have bought you a lot of stuff. So there you go. Now, I hope that's been an interesting educational video. If you like it, give it a thumbs up. If you don't, I don't care. Um, if you're not a subscriber, subscribe because there will be a lot more and varied content on this channel coming up. And if there's something you want to see, if you'd like me to look at a particular technology in the hobby or whatever and uh, explain some of it perhaps, then let me know in the comments and I'll do my best. In the meantime, thanks for watching. This is RC Model Reviews. Spot you later.